Do we need to rewrite physics? Fascinating new discovery at CERN once again raises more questions than it answers. Scientists are at a loss because antimatter just doesn't behave the way it should. And that could change our understanding of the universe forever. Make sure to stick around until the end for a physical identity crisis. Welcome everyone. Okay guys, no matter if you're made of antimatter or matter, go ahead and subscribe to the channel now. My goal for this year is to reach 40,000 subscribers. There are still a few missing, but I believe that together we can make it. Thanks a lot! And now imagine we could look into the smallest building blocks of matter in a gigantic microscope. What would we find there? Protons, neutrons and electrons, the fundamental particles that make up everything around us. Whether it's your smartphone, the air you breathe, or the most distant galaxies at the edge of the observable universe, everything consists of these three basic building blocks. And that's the first big mystery, because physics tells us that for each of these particles, an antiparticle must also exist. So there are antiproton, antineutron, and the antielectron, also called positron, which was discovered in 1932. And now here it comes. These antiparticles actually exist. At CERN in Switzerland, scientists can even artificially create them and examine them in elaborate experiments. However, the results of these investigations are currently causing quite a bit of confusion in the research community. But before we look at what puzzles the researchers, let's first clarify the most important question. What is antimatter actually? The British physicist Paul Dirac developed a mathematical theory as early as 1928 that predicted the existence of antimatter. Four years later, the American scientist Carl Anderson experimentally confirmed this prediction with the discovery of the positron. For this groundbreaking discovery, he was even awarded the Nobel Prize in 1936. What makes antimatter so special is that it behaves exactly the opposite of normal matter in many ways. For example, a positron has exactly the same mass as an electron, but a positive instead of a negative electrical charge. When matter and antimatter meet, something spectacular happens. They destroy each other in a process called annihilation. In the process, the entire mass of the two particles is converted into pure energy exactly according to Einstein's famous formula E mc2. At CERN, researchers can observe this process regularly by colliding anti-hydrogen atoms with normal hydrogen atoms. It's truly amazing to see how matter and antimatter annihilate each other, explains Jeffrey Hangst, spokesperson for the Alpha Experiment at CERN. Every annihilation releases tiny flashes of light like little cosmic fireworks in the laboratory. But this is exactly where the big mystery begins, which has occupied scientists for decades. If there is an antiparticle for every particle of matter, then there should actually be an equal amount of matter and antimatter in the universe. There shouldn't just be one time, but also an anti-time. And when the two touch, they annihilate each other. Shortly after the Big Bang, both types of particles were created in exactly equal amounts. But when we look around today, we find almost only normal matter where has all the antimatter gone? This so-called matter-antimatter asymmetry is one of the greatest unsolved mysteries in physics. To solve it, fundamental differences must exist between matter and antimatter, small deviations in their properties that have led to more matter prevailing in the end. And this is precisely where the current experiments at CERN come into play. For years, the scientists there have been meticulously examining the properties of antimatter and comparing them with normal matter. One of the most important questions is whether antimatter behaves in exactly the same way as matter in all four fundamental forces of nature. These four forces are the electromagnetic force, the strong nuclear force, the weak nuclear force, and gravity. When it comes to the electromagnetic force, the matter is clear. Here, the antiparticles simply behave in a mirror inverted manner to the normal particles. A positron is repelled by a magnet just as strongly as an electron is attracted. There also seems to be no difference in the strong nuclear force which holds the quarks together in protons and neutrons. It gets exciting with the weak nuclear force. Here, there are actually small differences between matter and antimatter. This asymmetry was already discovered in the 1970s and earned researchers James Cronin and Val Fitch the Nobel Prize in 1980. However, the differences are far too small to explain the observed matter-antimatter asymmetry in the universe. So that leaves gravity. Could it be that antimatter reacts differently to gravity than normal matter? This question has been occupying researchers at CERN for a long time, but to answer it, they first had to learn how to keep antimatter alive long enough to study it. It's not that easy because as soon as an antiparticle meets a normal particle, annihilation occurs. Imagine you want to study something that immediately annihilates itself. So, the scientists had to find a way to isolate antimatter from normal matter. The solution? 
They use strong magnetic fields to keep anti-hydrogen atoms suspended. It's like a kind of magnetic bottle, explains CERN physicist Stefan Ulmer. We create a complex magnetic field that prevents the anti-atoms from touching the walls of our apparatus. This allows us to store them for several minutes or even hours. And in a groundbreaking experiment, researchers recently succeeded for the first time in directly measuring the gravitational effect on antimatter. The result? Antimatter falls down, just like normal matter. At first it sounds pretty unremarkable, but it's actually a real sensation. Because there were indeed theoretical considerations that antimatter should fall up. This could have even explained the matter-antimatter asymmetry. As if gravity had separated the two types of matter in different directions of the universe, like chaff from wheat. The experimental setup was quite tricky. The researchers first created anti-hydrogen from positrons and anti-protons. These anti-atoms were then trapped in a magnetic trap. They then slowly weakened the magnetic field so that the anti-atoms could escape from the trap, either upwards or downwards. The result, 75% of the anti-atoms fell downwards. Gravity thus attracts antimatter just as it does matter. However, there is an interesting deviation. The measured gravitational acceleration was only about 75% of the normal value of 9.81 meters per second per second. And one thing I can say is that this really keeps scientists up at night. This is really puzzling, says Jeffrey Hengst. We clearly see that antimatter follows gravity, but why is the acceleration lower than for normal matter? We don't understand that yet. However, the researchers still need to be cautious here. The measurement inaccuracies in this first experiment were relatively large. Taking into account the error bars, normal gravitational acceleration is also compatible with the data. Improved follow-up experiments are already being planned to clarify this. The scientists at CERN are therefore facing a dilemma. On the one hand, they have demonstrated for the first time that antimatter follows gravity. A tremendous breakthrough. On the other hand, this insight doesn't help them solve the fundamental puzzle of matter-antimatter asymmetry. It's a bit like the universe wants to dance on our noses. Stefan Ulmer describes it like this. It's frustrating. The more closely we examine the properties of antimatter, the more similar it seems to be to normal matter. But there must be some fundamental difference, otherwise we wouldn't be able to explain why we live in a universe of matter. Let me know what you think in the comments. How can this asymmetry be explained? I'm super curious about your best theories. The search continues now. At CERN, new experiments are already underway, searching even more precisely for tiny differences between matter and antimatter. Maybe there are still undiscovered forces or particles that interact differently with antimatter. Or do we need to rethink our fundamental understanding of the early universe? One intriguing theory, for example, suggests that shortly after the Big Bang, there may not have been exactly equal amounts of matter and antimatter after all. If there were 1 billion antimatter particles to every 1 billion and 1 matter particles, that would explain the situation today. After mutual annihilation, exactly the amount of matter that we observe today would have remained. Look. We are the product of an epic battle between matter and antimatter. Without this great war of cosmic forces, we wouldn't be here today. A tiny deviation, and the cosmos would have annihilated itself right after its creation. Then there would have never been pizza. How tragic that would be. But this theory also raises new questions. What caused the tiny asymmetry? Was it pure chance, or is there a fundamental principle behind it that we don't yet know? So the scientists at CERN will have something to chew on for a while, but maybe that's what's so exciting about basic research. Every answer raises new questions, and sometimes the puzzles we find are even more fascinating than the answers we seek. The fact is, research into antimatter is not just an academic game. The insights could help us answer the most fundamental questions about our universe. Where do we come from? Why do we exist? And what does it even mean to be made of matter? Jeffrey Hanks says thoughtfully, Sometimes when I'm in the lab and I see matter and antimatter annihilating each other, I realize how improbable it is that we even exist. That out of the chaos of the early universe, a world has emerged in which intelligent beings can explore nature. That's actually a miracle. A nice thought to wrap up. I will, of course, keep you updated on all future insights and breakthroughs in antimatter research. So feel free to subscribe to the channel now. And now we travel to Antarctica. There, scientists have discovered something super exciting beneath the eternal ice. A gigantic structure that is larger than all of Belgium. No joke. The original footage and what this structure is all about can be found in the video displayed in the top right. Make sure to check it out. And if you click on the bottom right, you can watch another video about space and science. Every click helps the channel a lot. Otherwise, I'd say see you in the next video. Take care, guys.